We were in First Peter. <laughs> We've had, a, I think, about three rabbit trails since then, but if you will, go back to First Peter, and God willing, we're just going to pick up today where we left off, I don't know, what was that, two months ago? And uh, we're in First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lust, which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. And then we come to the passage we'll be looking at today. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as to the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and to the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. This is the word of the Lord. Father, thank you that your word is as practical as our being here this morning and getting out into our car and observing speed laws on our trip to eat lunch or heading home. Thank you, Lord, that this passage has something to say about that and a million other things that cross our busy lives in this fallen world. And we pray that you would bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to notice the uh, attitude of the believer towards the president, the governor, the city council, the police officer, the, uh, the judge. You just fill in the blank. It is bookended in these verses, and one is that we're to submit, and the other is that we're to honor Submit has a little bit of a feel like i got to obey this, even though I don't feel like it. Honor has the idea that I need to respect Caesar or respect the king. Uh, I want you to know that this is as practical as our Saturday afternoon hike yesterday, as we were trying to work up enough appetite to go out to Craves for Janelle's birthday. And uh, I was trying to figure out a way so we could hike in the Franklin Mountains for free, and so we made our way up Trans Mountain, and we parked, and we, uh, I, I was going to do a creative sneak back way to get to some trails. And then Andrew, my faithful obedient to the government son-in-law, pointed out that there's a no trespassing sign here. So we get Bree and the family back in the van, and we drive to Northeast El Paso, and I brightened up, and I said to my wife, hey, I know a free spot that we can hike in the edge of northeast El Paso. It's beautiful. And we park and we walk, I don't know, maybe an eighth of a mile, only to find that since the last time Marcy and I used that trail, they have put, posted a box where you're supposed to pay five bucks a person, which uh, I did the math. You know, I'm not the treasurer, thankfully, of GBF, but I did the math. That's $30. I'm already thinking about the food bill it craves. And so I'm like, I don't want to tack $30 on this. And it did cross my mind. It would be easy just to walk past this box and ignore that. I mean, I don't think the park ranger is here, right? I don't know where he was, but he's probably not here on a Saturday afternoon. But instead, we went the other way. <laughs> and we ended up on a kind of a weirded out hike, if you will, uh, all because of a posted box. But you see, this is very practical, this idea of obeying the laws of our city, the laws at Fort Bliss, the laws of the state of Texas, the laws from Washington, D.C., is very, very practical for each and every person here this morning. Now you say, but Ben, didn't uh, Peter, writing to these scattered, persecuted, first century believers, say, guys, 
You're aliens. You're exiles. You're uh, legal aliens of sorts. You sort of have one foot in this world and one foot in heaven. Uh, can't we just get by without ignoring, you know, I mean, think about it. The Caesars, do you get this, guys, were like homosexuals? Like this one guy named Nero, who assumed the rulership, I believe during the time of Peter, ascended the throne at the age of 17. He was a maniac. He was a homosexual. He was just a really weirded out guy. And Peter says, you're aliens. You're strangers. You're sojourners in this world. I mean, let's just sort of diss our responsibility to these uh, God-hating rulers and do our own thing, right? Get a pass. That means if I'm a Christian, I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ, and I see a no trespassing sign, I can just I trespass because I'm, I'm just an alien here, right? My citizenship is up there. Peter counterbalances this by saying, you know what, guys? If we're going to have the evildoers around us, the Gentiles, the pagans, the unbelievers around us, take a second look at this thing called Christianity, then we have to adorn the gospel through obeying our government. So, you know, this is sort of that sermon, and it feels a little bit like fingernails on the chalkboard, like, ugh. But that's what expository preaching is. It comes to a section in the text, whether, you know, it's the one that you're all pumped about, or you're like, eh, you know, talking about the government, my relationship to them, that doesn't conjure up warm fuzzies. But the Holy Spirit says, hey, the gospel, guys, is for every piece of pie in our lives. Every piece of pie. So we're going to look at this, and I want you to notice that in a world that was dominated by slavery and abuse and the abuse of women and the murder of children and female children being drowned because the parents uh, turned their thumbs down and said, I don't want a child and sexual sin was rampant and homosexuality was rampant among many of the Caesars. Uh, to that culture, by the way, the same culture that took Peter the author of this letter, and crucified him upside down. To that culture, he says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution. And then he names, you know, kings, or the ones sent out by the king's governors to do his work. And he says, submit to them. And he gives us, uh, a, a reason to give kudos to Charlie Denio, a police officer in our midst, and every one of those serving our nation in this way, because he clearly outlines the purpose of government. And I could get on a hobby horse and say, there's a lot of things our government is involved in today that are outside the perimeters of their God-given authority by God. Because the government, according to this passage, and according to Romans 13, is given for two reasons. Number one, to punish evildoers. So when you see the guy, the, the, the Boston bomber guy, get the death penalty, kudos, because the government is doing its job. Now here's the one that you just don't see. The second purpose or role of government is to praise those who do right. I mean, when you look at government, when you look at city hall or state or federal government, and you weigh it against what they're busy doing and what they're busy voting on and what they're busy, busy trying to get voted in on, how much of it has to do with punishing evildoers and rewarding those who do right? But that is the God-given role of human government. And then, you know, Bobby just took us through an apologetics uh, course, which was excellent, by the way. We're having a, an apologetic conference in mid-September with Charlie Campbell. Bobby will be telling us more about that. But there's an apologetic that our lives portray by our obedience and our submission and our respect to governing authorities. Look at verse 15. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. 
Listen, when you and I obey the speed limit laws and pay our taxes on time and refrain from smearing in an ungracious way political officials on our, on our Facebook site, we are doing something. We are muzzling. We are stopping the mouth of foolish men and women who look at Christians and say, you Christians are bad for our society. You're so earthly mind, heavenly minded that you're a no earthly good. And Peter is saying to these First century readers, when you submit, respect, obey the king, and obey the governor sent out by the king, you are in essence an apologetic for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 16, act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves to of God. We're going to get into that in quite a bit of detail. And then number 17 says, honor all people. Marcy and I went to Barrett's uh, graduation on Friday downtown, and there was a gentleman that came up to us and asked for a handout. And I told my wife, I said, you know what, he's in verse 17 of 1 Peter 2. Because I'm to show him because he's created in the image of God the same respect that I showed the president, the governor, the mayor of our city. There is a general respect for humanity, a dignity of human life. Now, somebody might be a scoundrel, be they a beggar or be they an officer in our government, but we still respect them as one who has the image of of God stamped upon their being. But, I like this, love the brotherhood. How many of you remember the love one another sermon from the fall or 1 Peter chapter 1 where it says that we're to fervently love one another with a sincere love? Brothers and sisters, we're going to need that during this talk about a building search. Parts of this might be edgy and that might get uncomfortable and it might, you know, it's like, what? You moved my seat, man. What's up with that? <laughs> Love the brotherhood. You respect everyone from the scoundrel to the leader of our nation, but you have a special love for your brothers and sisters in Christ. But there's only one that we're to fear. And that's God. You see, God trumps everything. We submit ourselves for the sake of the Lord. So here's the thing. If you're having a really difficult time respecting our elected officials, then just do this. Do it for the sake of our Jesus and of our Father. That's it. Do it for His sake. Because we only fear one God. Don't fear the one who can kill the body, but fear the one who can cast both soul and body into the lake of fire. <laughs> fear God, honor the King. All right. With that introduction, I want us to consider three implications. We're going to camp out on this number one quite a bit. We need to welcome the freedom of submission. Let's welcome the freedom of of submission. I'm going to read it again in verse 16. By the way, let me up the ante for why you need to really turn your hearing aid up on this first point. If you're not, you know, if you want to just get back to the government talk, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. But here's why you should up the ante on listening in on this. Because this thing of submission, guys, is all over the book of Peter. Look at verse 18. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect. Chapter 3, verse 1. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands. Later on, and I can't find the verse right in front of me, but he even talks about being submissive one to another. And let me say this, in our culture today, there's 
two words that are just dirty words in our culture. One is the idea of humility, and the other is the idea of submission. Don't you dare talk to me about submission, Ben. Listen, outside of this Christian the way phenomena that spread like wildfire from Jerusalem to Rome, the idea of submission outside of that was just weird. It was like, what are you talking about? So let's think about verse 16 for a few minutes. Act as free men. And don't use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves for God. Martin Luther put it this way when he talked about the freedom of the Christian. He said, a Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. Act as free men, And use it as bond slaves for God. Here's a way we could say that. We must live as free because we are slaves. I've told all my kids this. But I think uh, Bob Dylan can tell us as well. And I don't recommend the theology of the song from which it came. But listen to his words. He said, you may be a construction worker working on a home. You may be living in a mansion, or you might be living in a dome. You might own guns, and you might even own tanks. You might be somebody's landlord. You might even own banks. But you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil, or maybe the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. I would say, in so far at least at the chorus level, that he got it right. You see, Romans 6 points out uh, that you're either a servant of sin, and uh, that's going to result in death, or you're a servant of righteousness and obedience unto God. Young people, the biggest lie that the enemy has, is trying to sell you, that the culture is trying to sell you, is that you, you can just be free. You can just be free from. And, and I see this pursuit, I see it even in my own sinful flesh, dating back to my teenage years of, you know, when you see that sign that says, don't touch wet paint, what do you do? <laughs> Who put that up there? How dare they have the audacity to tell me? There's something within us that says, I want to be free. I want to be free. But you see, biblically, we're slaves of God and thereby freed up to serve others and obey the governing authorities. That's the context here. The culture suggests that um, freedom is freedom from all restraints. What do you think the... uh, the free sex and sex drugs and drugs rock and roll movement was all about in the 1960s. It was about the throwing off of restraint and being free. Just free to do whatever I please, with whom I please, and when I please, and how I please, without any restraints, without any constraints. To the degree that I'm serving someone or making a promise to someone or obeying someone, to that degree I'm not free because it cuts off my options. I want options. If I'm promising you this, or I commit to this person in marriage, then I cannot do this other thing, which means that I'm not free. You see, the modern understanding of freedom is that I'm free from restrictions. The more options I have, the more things I can choose. I remember taking Caleb, Josh, and Josiah, three oldest boys, backpacking for a day up in the uh, Gila wilderness outside of Silver City, New Mexico. And we ran into a couple, a 60-something-year-old couple, that had basically lived out of the back of their pickup for, I think, about 15 years. I think they did have residency established in Florida. 
But even when their kids were growing up, they just traveled the country. They went to Alaska. Every time they needed to check their email, they would go to the local library. And uh, their kids were long gone, but this couple just wanted to be free. In fact, they were thinking about building a rustic cabin in the Gila without even seeking to find out what the local rules were about just building your own place or owning the property before you, like, maybe build your place. See, they just wanted to be free from restraints and from constraints. So, when the Bible comes in at this thing, it says everybody's a slave. You're either a slave of sin or you're a slave of Christ. Here's the way Romans 6 puts it. Do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you're slaves of the one whom you obey? Either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you are now committed. Having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Here's the way one ancient Greek author put it. He said this, no one is wholly free. You're a slave to wealth or to the law or to the people you're seeking to please. You know what I see in my own life, in my own family, and I see this in a lot of us. Here's taking the mask off a little bit this morning. I think we're slaves to pleasing others. We are just slaves to that. We sweat bullets over that one. You see, everybody's committed to something to give them meaning in life, and therefore everybody has restrictions. Think about the guy, for example, that says, I can eat anything I want. Anything. But then he goes to the doctor after having some health problems, and the doctor says, you need to go on a very strict diet, or you're going to have a heart attack maybe in the next year. He says, in order to improve, you're going to have to eat these four things and stay away from these 2,000 things. That's pretty restrictive. But he says, you know, if you choose not to follow my restrictions, um, then you're free to eat what you choose and just die a young death. So you are free to choose, but you see either end has restrictions. How about this one? Uh... <laughs> Let's say that you pull up to the gas pump and uh, you have a diesel car. And you're like, man, diesel's really getting expensive. I, I need to watch my cash flow, right? I'm just going to put some unleaded in this baby. Um, you see, everything has restrictions. Everything. You have to find the restrictions that you were designed for. But you know, as we think about the Lord Jesus Christ, because we're going to see in the flow of chapter 2 of 1 Peter that we are called to imitate Christ and to follow in His footsteps. And Lu Lucy Shaw, who was a Christian poet, wrote a poem entitled Mary Song. And she was putting herself in the place of Mary. As she had been told by the angel that you're going to have the Son of God. You're going to bear the Son of God. And so she's thinking about this, this poet, and she said, Breath, mouth, ears, eyes, he is curtailed who overflowed all skies all years. Older than eternity, now he is new. Now native to earth as I am. Nailed to my poor planet, caught that I might be free. Blind in my womb to know my darkness ended. Brought to this earth for me to be newborn. And for him to see me mended, I must see him torn. Now native to earth as I am. Nailed to my poor planet. Jesus Christ who was free. He nailed himself willingly to a body of a servant and died the death of Calvary. 
And he confined himself by becoming human, going to the cross, losing infinite freedom that he had so you and I could be free. You see, the slavery that Christians are called to is a freedom from guilt. Anybody here laden with guilt this morning? You can be free in Christ. Anybody here have regrets and what ifs and if onlys in your life that dominate your thought process 24 7? You can be free of condemnation. There's no condemnation to those that are in Christ. There's freedom from enslaving emotions, from what the world even thinks about you, from the fear of death. There's freedom in that. I know, I know. That's a cool little talk on freedom and slavery and the oxymoron of verse 16. But how, Ben, can someone who is pro-life honor a president or a court that is pro-choice? How can someone who believes that marriage is for Adam and Eve submit to a court that says marriage is also for Adam and Steve? I think we have to address that at some level because it's implied in the text. If I'm going to honor the king, if I'm going to submit myself to the Lord's, for the Lord's sake, to the governing authorities, I have to grapple with some of the fallout of this downward spiral in our nation that I see only getting worse and worse and worse. So let's ask this question. How can we fear God and respect the king? How do you do that? How do you do that? Well, here's a second implication that I want to take you through. And that is we must realize that in this whole thing of submission, there are some exceptions. There are some exceptions. And here's what I would encourage you to write down. It's not in your notes on the screen, but here's what I would say. I must obey my government until obedience to my government makes me disobedient to Jesus Christ. I must obey my government until my obedience to my government makes me disobedient to Jesus Christ. Even if your property taxes sky rise, now you can protest those, There is a form for doing that. But even if it gets to the point where I have to fill out a form to plant a tree in my backyard, until something leads me to the point of being disobedient to Christ, I must submit to the government. So, what are some of these exceptions? What what might that look like? Well, maybe... Boy, you could spend a whole sermon or two. Maybe someday in Connections we'll give some time to this in light of what's going on in our nation. But uh, let's just stick with the Word and let the Spirit direct us. Uh, Number one, you have a story about some Hebrew midwives in Exodus chapter 1. And basically the Pharaoh, who was the king of their land, says, you know what, I want you to kill the male Hebrew babies. And the Holy Spirit in the text and flow of Exodus 1 says, because the midwives feared God, they refused to commit infanticide. Fast forward to Daniel, where you have some pretty up-and-coming young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they're called to bow to a statue of Nebuchadnezzar. And they refuse to bow, these monotheistic Hebrew lads refuse to bow to a statue of a pagan king. And basically, they're told if they don't bow down and worship the bust of Nebuchadnezzar, they will in fact be thrown into a fiery furnace. And I love, boy, this, this is better than Rocky Three music for the Christian. <laughs> and basically, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says, no, we won't do that. And they were ticked off and they turned the fire up. 
the heat up. And they said, you can throw us in the furnace if you want. But we're not going to bow to the king. The statue of the king. And worship him as a divinity. How about this one? Maybe you're out preaching with Peter and John in Acts chapter 4. And all they did was go around and talk about Jesus. Talk about Jesus. Talk about Jesus. Fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies of Messiah. And the governing authorities say, wait a minute. I don't want you speaking in the name of Yeshua Jesus anymore. And they say, we ought to obey God rather than men. Anybody looked at the postcard that Christ wrote recently to the church at Smyrna in uh, Revelation chapter 2 or 3? I think it's Revelation chapter 2 verses 8 to 11. Have you noticed that there's only two churches in those seven postcards that Christ wrote that get no rebuke, no call to repentance? These guys were suffering death. They were being thrown in the slammer. You know what was behind that? As... The Caesars conquered the outlying Greek world. The people were required once a year to bow down to a statue of Caesar and say, Caesar is Lord. Now, if you're an idol-worshipping Gentile, that's easy. That's a no-brainer. You'll just add Caesar to your many gods But to the worshipers of Jesus, they couldn't call Jesus Lord and Caesar Lord, and they refused to bow down, and therefore they began to lose their jobs and get thrown into the slammer. You see, there are reasons. There are times that we are called to disobey government. Let me give you some examples of... Biblical responses and some unbiblical responses. I I do this with a little bit of fear and trepidation because I'm only giving one sermon to this pretty wide, deep topic. And a very pertinent topic, by the way, in coming years for for we who live in these United States, I believe. But what is the difference between a biblical and an unbiblical response to the government? Number one, I must refuse, and these aren't up on your screen, but I must refuse to keep an evil law. But... I don't see anywhere in Scripture where I'm called to revolt against an evil government. There's nothing from the life of Jesus, from the life of Paul, from the life of Peter, about insurrection, about revolt, about overthrowing the government. Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. Here's another example. It is biblical to leave an evil country when they are oppressive. But no biblical allowance is given to overthrow an oppressive government. You say, what about Moses in Egypt? Didn't he end up freeing the midwives? They left the country. They were gone. Number three. It is biblical to accept unjust punishment of an unjust law, but there is no biblical justification to riot before an unjust government. I know I probably just opened a can of worms, and you know, you're like, what about the American Revolution? And, you know, what about July the 4th? We, we're not going to even go there. Just thank God for these United States of America. Respect the governing authorities, and, and let's go forward. What, however you feel about that, or maybe you've never even thought about it. But let me take you to this third implication from these verses. And that is we need to weigh our responsibility before God and government. By the way, I'm going to give you seven things. These are quick. We won't be here till noon getting through these, I trust. But I, I do want to... I think these are up on the screen. Because, I, I, you know, as I thought about this, as I was wrestling with this and, and studying this, and I want to give you the fruit of the study, not just take you through every nuance of every word in the text, I'm like, these are the questions that you and I are going to be asking. 
about what does it look like, Ben, to submit myself to the king and to the governors for the sake of Christ. What does it mean to fear God and honor the king? What in the world does that look like in 2015? So let me give you seven things. Number one, point out the bad of the government to others. I'm not saying all the time, but I'm just saying that there is a biblical precedence for that. I'll give you a couple of texts. <coughs> Uh, Mark chapter 8, verses 14 and 15, where we're told to beware of the leaven of the Jewish religious leaders and Herod, King Herod. How about Luke chapter 22, verses 25 to 27? You see, in both of those passages, Jesus is using government as examples of what we should not be. Do any of you wince when your kiddos pass through the den and you've got it turned on to your favorite news cable channel? I mean, it's just X-rated stuff sometimes, isn't it? Ever since the Clinton scandal, maybe in the, what was it, the 90s? And you're like wincing. But I think what we can do is we see these senators or congressmen or whoever they are, is we can say, kids... Don't be like Senator so-and-so. Or church, when you see this senator or this congressman to win a vote waffling on what he believes or she is for, to get just to, you know, wipe, stick her finger up in the air of human opinion, and it's always changing just to get the votes. Just say, we're not called to do that. We're called to be forthcoming to say what we mean and mean what we say, and to be people of conviction. Number two, another responsibility, is we can point out the evil of the government to the government. We can do that, particularly in a democracy, but Jesus did it. Or I should say, John the Baptist did it. Uh, in Luke chapter 3, verses 18 to 20, don't turn there, but it says... So with many other exhortations, he preached the gospel to the people. But when Herod the Tetrarch was reprimanded by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, he was having a sexually immoral relationship. And John the Baptist didn't put up with that. And because of all the wicked things that Herod had done, Herod also added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. You see, John the Baptist, as the forerunner of Christ, as the preacher of repentance, did not back away from confronting the sin of Herod. Didn't go so well for John the Baptist because he gets locked up in the slammer and by Mark chapter 6 he gets his head chopped off. You remember that story? But I think we see an implication that for those of you that want to write letters to your senator or to your congressman or whatever the case might be, do it but do it respectfully and honorably in keeping with what adorns the gospel of grace. Justin Martyr at the end of the first century sent a letter to the Roman Senate and he said this, I give you advanced warning, you will certainly not escape the coming judgment of God if you persist in your injustice. That's maybe a pretty good line to use if you do write those letters. Number three, I think we can honor those who serve in the government. Honor those who serve in the government. You know, whenever you see Jesus or Peter or Paul or others going about preaching the word of Christ, His death, His burial, His resurrection, and they're preaching to centurions and to soldiers. Paul's writing about soldiers when he's chained to one in the Praetorian Guard 24-7. They never speak in a derogatory term. King Agrippa, depending on what translation you have, he says to Paul, after Paul shares his testimony and points him to Christ, he says, do you think in such a short time you can persuade me to become a Christian, a follower of Jesus? And the point is, Paul would not have said to him, if he had believed in Christ as Messiah, you have to resign from your post immediately. No, the government and their officials, whether they were tax collectors for the Roman IRS or centurions who trained soldiers or soldiers, 
are always considered honorable occupations. What about Joseph and Daniel? Now granted, they weren't at Franklin High School. You know, when they do that career path choice thing, I don't know, do they even do that anymore? Um, what do you want to do? What do you want to major in in college? I mean, neither Joseph or Daniel picked this. It got picked for them. But Daniel served under a Babylonian king for decades. And he was a man after God's own heart. In fact, it is difficult if you look at the life of Joseph and the life of Daniel to see any smear on their resume. We know they were sinners because only one man ever walked this planet who was perfect. Number four, how are we to do this thing? We need to set an example for the rest of society. Remember a story about a couple of guys that were seminary students. And uh, they were taking an elongated break in the bathroom. And one was purported to share his uh, co-worker in the hearing of the boss. I just read three chapters of John in the John. You know, that sounds spiritual. But, but I think what we see is that you and I are called to good deeds, to abstain from fleshly lust, to do right, verse 15, or in the words of Titus 3, to be subject to rulers, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, to be gentle, to show every consideration for all men. And what are we doing there? We're letting our light shine before men by obeying the speed limit. By obeying the no trespassing laws. By paying our taxes with full disclosure of our financial portfolio. By not smearing or speaking of evil in a ruler in a way different than Christ or the apostles would. You know, that takes wisdom and boldness and grace and humility. Number five, evangelize as many people as possible. You know, there was a, a movement in the 70s with Jerry Falwell and many others, and it was called the Moral Majority. And the, the movement within uh, some very godly segments of, of the evangelical church was this. If we can get elected officials that are godly into Washington and into Austin and into City Hall, if you will, we're going to better our country. And that is true. The problem is it didn't work. But you see, the, it was only a reminder that to change a law is not going to change a heart. Here's the way Paul put it in 2 Corinthians 5.17. He says, if any man be in Christ, he is a what kind of creature? He's a new creature. The old is gone and the new has come. You could change all the laws you want. You could even Christianize an entire society like Constantinople did in the 3rd or 4th century. But if there's not a new birth, if there's not a transformed heart, if there's not an exchange of a heart of stone for a heart of flesh through the power of the Gospel, you're not going to see lasting change anyway. Now, the next suggestion that I have for you may sound almost a little bit opposite of that. We need to vote. We need to vote. And this is contextualized in our culture because our government gives us an opportunity that a lot of types of government in the world do not give. The opportunity to express your will on the government or with the government. Hey, if you have an opportunity to go into the polling booth, you should not miss that opportunity to vote. Know something about the candidate and the issues. And even if you don't, piggyback off somebody who does, who's done the research. Because Proverbs says, Righteousness exalts a nation, 
But sin is a disgrace to any people. So the fact that this world is going to hell in a handbasket and that the only government that is going to last and bring lasting peace is when Jesus Christ rules and reigns does not negate our responsibility to vote. I'm going to show you a really cool text in a minute about that. But number seven, we need to pray. Uh, let's go over to, you're almost there, turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2, look at verse, first couple of verses here. First of all then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who what? Desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. We need to pray for our president, for our governor, for our senator, for our congressman, for our mayor, for our city council, so that we can lead peaceful and quiet lives. Because government is given as a gift from our God to harness a world that is seething with evil. So that the message of the gospel can run and triumph. Let's, in closing, go over to Jeremiah chapter 29. I hadn't really seen this before. This is a beautiful passage of Scripture. Because as you're looking at this, and as you're looking at where our nation is today, and where it seems to be heading so quickly... It's like a snowball that started at the top of the mountain and it's just going faster and faster and faster downhill. And it's like, this is an avalanche and it seems from a human perspective there ain't no stopping it. And then we read in the Bible that rights, wrongs are going to be righted and kings are going to be forced to bow to King Jesus who will come with a sharp sword protruding from His mouth to judge the earth. So we're just kind of like, well, just just hold our breath till Jesus comes. Because this world is just messed up. And it's heading for judgment. I want you to look at this, though, in Jeremiah chapter 29. Start in verse 4. This is a message to the Jews in Babylonian captivity. They're in a pagan land. They're under a pagan ruler. And by the way, he was so arrogant that he, as it were, shook his fist in the face of God. He was defiant towards God. And these people, God's people, were taken into captivity. And they were ready to be brainwashed by the Babylonian culture and the Babylonian system. And in verse 4, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Look at this. Build houses and live in them. And plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives. Become the fathers of sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and daughters. Give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and don't Decrease, and notice verse 7, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray for the city. This is a pagan city, a fallen system. And he says, for in its welfare you will have welfare. What is he doing? Do you ever feel like an exile in El Paso, Texas, in these United States? The more you search the web and read the papers, if you still do the papers, I know Norm does and I do once in a while, you just say, man, (coughs) let's just all, let's all, let's take GBF and let's move, I don't know, to some remote corner of the Yukon and just go communal, right? 
Let's do our own, you know, Marcy will make our bread for everybody. <laughs> Ellen will make cheesecake for everybody. I think that's all we need, right, is the bread and the cheesecake. Everything else is good. Because this world is, is under the wrath of God and it's only going to get worse. And when God writes to His people, He says, No, live in the city and pray for the city because if you do that, it's going to have an effect on your own well-being in the city. Get married. Buy a house, if you will. Plant a garden. Eat the produce. Marry your daughters off. Enjoy your grandkids. You're exiled. Do all of that. <laughs> and you know, that, if you go on in the text, um, verse 10, he says, Thus says the Lord, When seventy years have been completed for Babylon... I'll visit you and I'll fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. You see, God, God is telling them to pray for the city, to seek the good of the city, to do life in the city, knowing that that's not the end all. So I pray that collectively, GBF, the people in El Paso would not be able to malign us. That they would not be able to slander us because of evil doing. But that they could look at our good deeds. Even something as simple as obeying simple laws that we may not agree with. If you can't find any in your heart to do it because you have a warm fuzzy towards the officials behind it, then do it for Christ's sake. Amen.